you have indeed given me a challenge to try and cover this topic in 15 minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to get, 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 get the, the essentials out, but uh, clearly it is, it, it is a complicated area. So, uh, without further, uh, much further ado, um, when we're talking about the key factors in the function of the normal bladder, the two components, um, filling and voiding. So filling, when we're talking about filling, we're talking about continence, sensation of bladder volume, and as well as receptive relaxation, i.e. As the, as the bladder fills, it should relax to keep us at constant pressure. Um, and in voiding, um, which obviously only occupies a very small amount of the time uh, uh, um, in terms of function of the bladder, so our key components are voluntary initiation and we want it to empty completely. So when we're talking about the components of the, uh, of the sort of micturition system, um, uh, the first bit to, to mention is, is the urethral sphincters. And so this is such a component, consists of two, two components to then further subdivide. So the bladder neck which really is only active during ejaculation, and the distal urethral sphincter, which consists of three components, the smooth muscle component, also known as the lysosphincter, the intrin intrinsic striatus sphincter, the, the rhabdo sphincter, that's probably the bit that we most not commonly consider to be the, 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 the key components. And this is slow twitch muscle fibers. And then there's the extrinsic stri striatus sphincter, the pelvic floor, which we've already heard uh, a lot about in different contexts uh, as part of these talks. Controlling all of that is the first sort of key neurological components is ONUS nucleus, is S2, S3, and S4 is based in. It's a, and you get a, a, a nerve, a somatic nerve from the, from the anterior horn along the pedendal. And this essentially controls the sphincter and also initiates the guarding reflex to, to stop leakage when there is any kind of strain. There's a further connection of onus um, uh, nucleus with, with an upper motor nucleus nucleus. Actually, that, 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 the exact location of that has never really been fully identified, but we know from other studies that there must be something there that does connect. So then, Having talked about sphincters, we talk about the bladder itself. The bladder is composed of multiple segments of smooth muscle and each with their associated gang. Each segment exists, exhibits spontaneous activity, micro emotions. In that sense, it actually has some similarities with, with heart tissue, that it has its own intrinsic activity. It cannot therefore be completely denervated. It has tone and activity as intrinsic characteristics. Moving on to the next sort of important neurological component is the sacral, sacral micturition center. So in terms of, it, this is the parasympathetic component, again, from air root, nerve roots S2, 3, and 4. Um, this connects with the intermediate lateral gray and provides the motor control to the bladder and coordinates the micro motions. In addition, the bladder's also got some C fibers, which gives reflex bladder contractions to the fringe point of pain. The lumbar sympathetics are at, at, a, at a slightly higher level, and these control the receptive relaxation. It's very important that as the bladder fills, the muscles relax. So you get the sympathetic storage reflex. Um, in addition, they control the bladder neck, um, which we mentioned before in terms of, in, in, in terms of part of the sphincter compass for, for ejaculation, uh, and um, the, the sphincter itself is, it, it leads to sort of relaxation of the smooth muscle. The next really important part on the, from a neurological point of view is the pontine micturition center. So this has a, a, a medial micturition center and a lateral storage center. And this is the sort of motor center for the autonomic control of the lower urinary tract. This is where it all coordinates. This in turn communicates with the periaqueductal gray, which receives alpha delta fibers as well, uh, to further sensory fibers from the, from the bladder. And this is where all the coordination occurs. And that largely is, is, is are the, the, the key components. If we put all of that together, we, we can talk about sort of spinal reflexes occurring um, with reflex bladder contraction controlled by the say, say, say called micturition center. We've got the guarding reflex from onus nucleus and receptive relaxation, again, due to sympathetic storage reflex. Within the midbrain, so at a, at, a, at a slightly higher level, we've got the periaqueductal gray and the pompotide micturition center. This sort of coordinates, coordinates everything that's going on and completes avoiding. And then finally, the, we've got the cortex where we get the sensation of filling and we get voluntary initiation, so social, social voiding. So moving, moving on from having got the sort of basics of the of the uh, uh, the anatomy, anatomy and physiology of this, we talk about bladder management and spinal injury. So 
There are some general issues uh, for all spinal injury patients. So um, these could, what is the level of their neurological diagnosis? And we'll talk about that a little bit uh, in, in a bit more detail. But in addition, where, where they are in their clinical course, are they right, are they early in the spinal injury, you get level spinal shock, depending on, uh, depending on where they are in their clinical course, things will, things will progress and some function will return. Um, what degree of mobility have they got? Are they paraplegic, tetraplegic? What degree of hand function? Clearly very important for intermittent self-catheterization. Degree of memory and intelligence. Has there been any um, um, brain trauma as well as part of the spinal trauma? And, and what level of motivation have they got in terms of carrying out certain things? Social support and obviously lifestyle. The, the, the sort of management that you're going to look at in, 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 in a young, active 30-year-old is going to be very different to so someone who's in their late 80s and maybe less active. So, broadly speaking, we've got four potential management options um, that we talk in terms of. It's voiding with control, contained incontinence, intermittent self-catheterization, and obviously an indwelling catheter. I've also put urinary diversion there in brackets because that's always a potential option. But I have to be honest, it's not one that we would use take on lightly there are situations where you might need to use that as a sort of a last re last resort but generally we're talking about the other four so when we're talking about voiding with control that can take depending on the level of injury and and, and, and the type of injury it can take very much a number of different forms so true voluntary voiding is, is like it's only occurring quite incomplete lesions however in many lesions if you've got new neurogenic detrusive overactivity that allows toileting in relation to the sort of preserved bladder sensation and you can also couple that with regular triggered micturition so you're relying on those intrinsic uh, 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 contractions occur as a, re as a result of the neurogenic detrusive activity um, emptying by straining in the face of, of, of sphincter weakness is another is another possibility particularly in um i've got a more flaccid bladder Contained incontinence, so again, in, in, in terms of neurogenic um, detrusive overactivity, with, re with reflex avoiding, you can be voiding into a sheath or pads. Passive emptying due to severe sphincter weakness, again, that can occur into, in, into a sheath or, or pad. Or where, there's, where there is DSD, so detrusive sphincter dysphenergy or poorly sustained contractions, that may actually limit limit this as an option. Intermittent self catheterization, obviously, that's a very popular form of management, and it clearly relies on, on adequate hand function, but is often the mainstay of man managing spinal injury patients ever since Lapides first described this. Um, finally, arguably the least desirable of the, of the different uh, managements is the indwelling catheter. You usually would prefer to put that in suprapubically to prevent the long-term damage to the urethra. Um, and this can be used with or without a catheter valve. So we already talked about the various anatomical levels. But broadly speaking, we can, we can just divide our management up into two, whether this is a sort of a sacral lesion, it's a conus, uh, conus lesion, so the conus ends at about L2 and sacral uh, um, micturition center is involved, or if it's something further up, and hence the periaptic aqueductal gray and the pontine micturition center are disconnected. So if we start with sort of conus, sacral root, or peripheral injuries in, at that level, Typically, you'll get these are lower motor neuron lesions. You get a flaccid paralysis and sensory loss, absent conus reflex, as a bulbar cavernosus reflex. Uh, you get detrusor a reflexia or redu and reduced compliance and uh, like sphincter weakness or a non-relaxing urethral sphincteric obstruction. When I say non-relaxing, this then relates to the smooth muscle the sphincter rather than the rhabdo sphincter. So when we talk about complete conus injuries, our options are again the same four. Voiding with control, so if they're able to empty by straining, if the bladder has a good capacity and the sphincter tone is adequate, it may be possible to do that, and that gives good voiding with control. So clearly, that's not always possible, in which case you're looking more in the direction of contained incontinence, uh, particularly if the sphincter is, it allows that and is weak. Otherwise, intermittent self-catheterization is probably the most common form of, of management in, in, in this group of patients. If the bladder capacity is satisfactory and the sphincter tone is is adequate. Uh, failing that, an indwelling catheter is always uh, a, a, an option. Moving on to supraconal uh, disease, so if you've got uh, typically with spastic power or quadriplegia with sensory loss, here the conus reflexes will be present because the lesion is above the above the conus, so that pathway is intact. 
neurogenic diffuser activity, um, diffuser sphincter dysynergia, so DSD, essentially where the bladder is trying to squeeze against the closed sphincter, like there's very characteristic um, appearances on neurodynamics, which I'll show you in a second, and you'll get a poorly sustained diffuser contraction. And again, that's because the bladder is trying so hard to squeeze against this closed sphincter. And again, when we look, we look back to what we discussed in terms of the uh, the uh, neurological side, as you can understand that because you've just, that's no longer being coordinated. So this is the sort of classic appearance of uh, detrusive sphincter dysynergia, um, where you can see the sawtooth appearance, where the where the detrusive muscle is desperately trying to squeeze past a closed sphincter, and you're getting this sort of up and down where it's where it's squeezing and the sphincter is giving away a little bit, and then it's and then it's closing again, and so on, giving that sort of sawtooth pattern. So what are the what are the options? Again, we we talk about the same same four options, but applied slightly differently. So you can have voiding with control using a triggered reflex, typically tapping on the bladder. To be honest, this is rarely used nowadays in, in, in clinical practice. This is kind of unreliable uh, and can often lead to other long term bladder problems. Uh, contained incontinence certainly an option using a penile sheet sheath or pads. So as long as they've got sufficient diffuser over activity and the and uh, and the sphincter isn't um, preventing voiding, this is an option. Obviously, DSD, distributed sphincter dys dysynergia, is, is, is very problematic, and the sphincter is too, is, is, too, um, uh, is preventing any urine coming through. They may need to even have the sphincter resected um, to, 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 to allow this. Alternatively, intermittent catheterization, again, uh, uh, probably the most important option in, in, in most of these patients. Um, but it does uh, uh, it, it, it um, doesn't uh, require that the detrusive contractions are are suppressed either with medications such as anticholinergics or with intravesical Botox injections. Um, otherwise, we're going to get leakage between between catheterization. And then finally, as I say, the final option is always an ingrown catheter. I've talked primarily about complete injuries. Obviously, with incomplete injuries, it depends on the degree of preservation, sensation, motor control. You may even have full control, or you may have something in between. Also, depends on whether the at what level the incomplete injury is at. Um, why do we need to do this? Why is this why is this so important? Well, neuropathic urinary tract risks are are significant. It used to be the most common uh, cause of death among spinal injury patients until we were aware of better bladder management. So hydronephrosis in the in, in, in the male due to sort of long-term renal failure, pyelonephritic scarring from infection, stone disease, and uh, as well autonomic dysreflexia. Just a quick mention on autonomic dysreflexia because I think it's important that, that every urologist is aware of that. So this is a life-threatening emergency. It occurs in patients with lesions above T6. Common stimuli are sort of Irritation within the, the bladder, um, or bladder overfilling, fecal loading, skin skin irritation. Uh, essentially, it's a massive sympathetic discharge, which and those reflexes can't be inhibited by higher senses because they've been cut off. Um, and the signs are usually flushed skin above the injury level, increased blood pressure, hypertension, uh, bradycardia, and headache. Management, but crucial thing is to recognise it, which is why I'm emphasising this. Remove the stimulus. Um, empty the bladder, unblock the catheter, remove any irritants. Any any urologist could, could, can come across this in any situation. Anyone's got a block catheter or during neurodynamics or, or, or some other form of irritation. Sit the patient up. Um, necessary pharmac uh, pharmacotherapy can be useful. So nifedipine, 10 milligrams or GTN, 400 micrograms sublingually available and obviously monitor the blood pressure until things settle down. That's basically it. Whistle stop tour of neurourology. Thank you very much.